Well, hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to our panel discussion on well-being in time of COVID-19. I'm Mayor Pro Tem Lauren Meister. I'm here with my colleague, Council Member Seppi Schein, who is also the moderator of this wonderful event. And we have some great panelists for you, and we're going to talk about our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the reopening of the economy and society. Um, you know, all of us have gone through quite a year, and uh, uh, Council Member Shine and I were talking about how stressed out everyone is, and for all different reasons. And uh, we thought that this would be a, a great way to um, to bring out those issues and let everyone know we're we're all in the same boat. <laughs> we all we all have had a terrible year, and we don't know you know what's coming next. And uh, and there's a lot of obvious a lot of stress uh, that goes along with that. So on that note, I'm going to pass this on to my esteemed colleague, Councilmember Seppi Shine. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Meister, and um, thank you for uh, co-sponsoring this item. And it's been a pleasure working with you, uh, bringing our incredible panel of experts together. I want to thank staff for uh, doing an incredible job as well, um, as well as thanking our colleagues for supporting uh, Mayor Lindsay Horvath, Council Member D'Amico, and Council Member John Erickson. Um, this is very timely given that we are coming out of COVID. We're still a little bit in COVID, but to a point where we're going out in person and just being out in itself is, um, has been so strange to not be uh, seeing your friends on Zoom in a box, but to feel people and be close. And then what do you do? Do you hug? Do you not hug? The world has changed dramatically really in so many ways. And um, I'm so honored to have our panelists here who will be able to really address the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual issues um, and give us tips and tools and have a great discussion. Um, first, I want to um, introduce Reverend Karen Frost. Reverend Karen Frost is the co-founder and senior minister of Spirit Uncensored an organization centered on the concept of love as a religion. On January 1st, 2021, she launched hashtag best day ever moment, a social media movement designed to inspire everyone to live each day, expecting to experience the best day ever. I love that. From 2018 to 2020, she worked as a TV executive for Juvie Productions, Viola Davis and Julius Tennant's production company. She is currently pursuing a career as a TV writer. Thank you for being with us, Reverend Frost. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lauren Costine. Dr. Lauren Costine is a licensed psychologist, relationship coach, consultant, author, educator, activist, and international speaker. Dr. Lauren has dedicated her life to helping people find wholeness within themselves through the dynamic world of inner work. Her first book, Lesbian Love Addiction, Understanding the Urge to Merge and How to Deal When Things Go Wrong is fantastic and is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. She has been in private practice for over 21 years and has been using telehealth in her work for years. Her most recent passion is the creation of a holistic therapy center with her wife, Vanessa Costine, named Awaken Therapy Center where they are now offering hybrid services via online sessions and in-person when safe. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Lauren Costing. Um, now I'd like to introduce Susan Isaacs. Susan Isaacs is a certified professional dog trainer, a graduate of Balu Academy for Dog Trainers, a member of the Dog Trainers Alliance of Southern California and AKC canine good citizen evaluator, a licensed presenter for family paws, parents education, and dog gone safe. And she volunteered for three years as lead trainer for the LA chapter of Pets for Vets. Susan has been training dogs 
for over 17 years and continues to add her knowledge and technical skills by attending workshops with leaders in the behavior and training field. Before opening her own dog training business, Susan spent over 15 years in the corporate world coaching executives and employees, and it's her solid understanding of behavior and psychology, human and canine, that makes her so successful in helping owners resolve and solve dog behavior problems. She uses positive reinforcement training methods, so happy about that, grounded in the latest behavioral science Susan, thank you for being with us. And um, I'd like to introduce Rashad El Amin. Rashad El Amin and his amazing wife, Crystal, established Foxy and Fierce, a martial art training facility located in the heart of West Hollywood in 2010. They, did, they teach their blend of full body fitness and kickboxing basics, keeping it fun and engaging while teaching valuable skills that last a lifetime. I can attest to that. Um, as a teen, Rashad trained in Hapkido and Karate under former Black Panther and community organizer, Akil Bashir, and trained in boxing under world champion trainer, Shadid Suluku, Suluki. He holds a Bachelor of Fine, Art, Fine Arts from UC Santa Barbara and was a collegiate athlete on the track team com and competed in the 100 meter, 200 meter, and was the anchor of the four times 100 meters sprint team. Wow. Back in March of 2020, like most boutique fitness studios, Foxy and Fierce was forced to close their doors and stop in-person training. They immediately launched Foxy and Fierce Virtual Gym, where they offer live stream classes and on-demand workouts that can reach people worldwide. Rashad, thank you. Thank you for being with us. And um, I, I'm actually going to direct um, the first questions to you. The way we're going to go about this tonight is to go physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, and um, and top it off with uh, the amazing Susan Isaacs. Um, with respect to physical well-being, please share with us your own experience during the pandemic, as well as the experience of uh, maybe some of your clients. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I think in terms of, um, I mean, we went all through a number and so much of our uh, mental health is corresponds to how we feel physically. Um, so we, we basically shut down early. Um, we saw what was coming. And we decided to close down. And then about a week after that, there was a mandatory shutdown. So we, and, and, and our goal just to really um, keep our community alive, we basically just started teaching online almost immediately. And we use Zoom as our platform. And, you know, we just kind of made a makeshift little stage of our living room and just started to teach. But what was even more important than that was that the working out aspect is that we had a, a little thing that we did called coffee talk. We got to, you know, just to meet and talk amongst each other. Because, you know, if you do any kind of group fitness classes at times, if you have a good community vibe, you guys meet and talk to each other and then you work out. So we wanted to maintain that. And our coffee talks got longer and longer <laughs> before we even started working out. Um, but that was the thing that, that we did. And we did it every day. Uh, initially, we literally did it every morning. Uh, and then we scaled back to five days a week and then sometimes twice a day. But for, you know, you know, the gals who I train who are who were really into fitness and and it's just something that was habitual, you know, it was one of the things that you did. You get up, you work out, uh, you go to work or you go to work and you come home, you work out. And it's and it's those things that um, kick your endorphins up, help you feel good. Uh, but even more so considering the virus that was attacking the world what we saw was something that um, was really going after your cardiovascular health. And so for me, mm -hmm. I just took it to be my responsibility to keep people moving so that they keep their lungs strong and they keep their heart strong. And I think that was the kind of the biggest thing for me. It's like, you know, I tried to just to have some kind of um, uh, a method of someone to be accountable to, you know, that, that's kind of the toughest thing, you know, like even, for us, it was, it, it was really tough because, you know, we went from, 
um, kind of out, I mean, for us, we're kind of out on the ledge for a second. You know, your business is moving, things are going great, but you see this thing come, kind of coming on the horizon, this kind of dark cloud, you know what's happening. Uh, and then we really had to figure out what we're gonna do. Um, so in a way, you know, it was, it was really tough because we went from having income to no income, but we, but we had our support group of people to kind of be with us. And as much as I, I feel like I know that people um, benefited from the classes and the workouts, I benefited from the people who were bas basically continuing that relationship with us. So, I mean, it was just a reciprocal situation. Um, and and the, the oddest thing about that is that I got even in better shape because when you're, when you're teaching online, you just gotta go all the way, <laughs> you know, you gotta push yourself 110% so that people kind of can move with you and they push themselves. So I actually got in really good shape, but even more so I, I got to just, you know, bring even new people on. Uh, we kind of launched a virtual gym after that and, and different people came on and did online classes with us. And we have a library of classes, which we still have. But I think at the end of the day, um, I think the best thing is no matter where you are, there's some people who weren't in the habit of working out and then we're in a situation where they're you know can't go anywhere you know we were, the lockdown was really intense uh and it was a very scary time mentally it was very scary because there was so much misinformation and information that may be true but you don't know if it's true because there's so much other information coming in and then the information changes uh so just to have something um that gets you moving so it can bring you outside of your head is so important you know um yeah, absolutely well i have a question for you yes so um what about the people that didn't form a habit of of being home because at, it, honestly when we weren't in lockdown mm -hmm. even if you didn't exercise you still were walking you were walking your dog on right. long walks you were maybe um going to the office going to lunch still moving a mm -hmm. lot of us it was just like solitary so yes. what, what what would you say are some tips for people who have mostly dramatically been solitary mm -hmm. um and as far as what should they do to get back to physical wellness okay i would say the first thing is just to take the baby steps you know if you've been inactive this whole time you have to start where are you what in terms of what you can do if you have if you're mobile if you can walk it is time to get out and it is time to walk. It is time to walk 30, 40 minutes a day and fill your lungs with oxygen. If you cannot walk, okay, there are fantastic exercises that you do from your chair. You know, maybe you can walk, but your legs aren't strong. Maybe you have problems with your knees, problems with your back. There are things that you can do chair workouts that get you moving. I know, um, my mom in particular is, you know, I start, my mom can do some kickboxing, but she likes uh, jazzercise, you know what I mean? Even though she doesn't have a community where she talks to people personally, she utilizes the videos. Like the thing about the situation that we had, it was the best of time and the worst of time. Like considering if this would have happened 20 years ago, when there was, the internet wasn't robust, where we didn't have um, smartphones, all these things that we could utilize now, there's apps that um, I always say, just find your sport. You know, there's this one thing, there's something that you can do that's gonna engage you actively and uh, you have to find your sport. And you can look on an app and you can find that one thing that's good or you can maybe, um, you know, find that video online that that's, fits what you like to do and what you enjoy. Those are all things that are very important. Uh, just to get, get your mind and body engaged. Something that a sport is something that's going to get your mind and your body engaged. And that's, you got to find that one thing that's good for you. Absolutely. And um, just to add to that, the other part of this lockdown and COVID was so many of us were in front of the screen on Zoom or in front of our computers, but not in the proper ergonomic space. Yes. Uh, so that, I, I have a friend who said that she, because uh, she's a writer and because she was just at home in a space that wasn't conducive to um, proper uh, posture, she's now developed serious neck injuries. 
Yes. So, okay. so what, 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 what about, um, I know you said take it slow, take it baby steps. Um, where can people find uh, these chair exercises or anything having to do with slowly um, getting back and healing in that sense? Okay, very good question. All right, now, all right, now, in terms of YouTube is a great resource. We have a, a virtual gym and we do, we have beginner workouts and intermediate workouts. You can look on us, foxingfirst.com, but another great resource is YouTube. I think that a lot of what people are experiencing has to do with maintaining good proper core strength. When you talk about core, you're mm -hmm. thinking about your abs and your lower back and your hamstrings and your glutes. So it's like the center of your body. Um, if you're in a chair, you have to always like, you know, a lot of people from sitting are having sciatic issues. They're having issues mm -hmm. in their upper, upper and lower back. It's, it's good to find the good core exercises. I mean, when you're thinking of strength training, a lot of people think of like lifting weights and being strong, but a lot of what really needs to um, be taken care of is your proper core strength, working on the muscles that support your upper back and your posture, the muscles that support mm -hmm. your lower back, simple basic core exercises. Um, YouTube is a really good resource. You can look at our virtual gym is another good resource, but that those are good things. There are a lot of great free resources uh, out there but you have to search for them and you'll, but you, what you need to look for are basic core exercises. And those are the things that's going to help people out maintaining that structure of their body. Thank you so much. Yes. No, those, those, that, those are some really good tips and reminders. I, I, um, I started getting back into fitness. You'll be very happy to hear. Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, coming back to Foxy and Pierce too. Yes. Um, and you're doing in person too, correct? Yes, we are back open and so happy. So okay. happy. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much, Rashad. This was great. I'm going to um, move to Dr. Lauren Costine. Um, Dr. Costine, um, if you can unmute yourself and share with us um, your experience, or if you can, the collective experiences of others that you have knowledge of with respect to the emotional and mental effects of the pandemic on people? Well, you know, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here presenting for West Hollywood and the wonderful council and to be with all of you. So this is really wonderful. Um, you know, I, I really like what Rashad said, the best of times, the worst of times. Uh, uh, you know, I was immediately like, yeah, that's very similar to what I've found in the mental health world. Mm -hmm. So we had this unprecedented experience. No one could have ever imagined this was hap really gonna happen to us. And there was a myriad of experiences that happened for folks. Um, and that was really horrible, obviously, for many reasons. I mean, there was a major grief. If you were losing someone, there was fear of one's own safety. If we really look at like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our first one is physiology, getting our basic needs met, then safety, then love and belonging, then esteem, then sort of higher levels of needs of like self-actualization, self-transformation, right? Well, when those bottom three are being affected, which were, you know, people were maybe not getting, lost their job. Are they gonna have a home? Are they gonna be able to eat? Are they feeling safe? No, none of us were really feeling very safe. So um, love and belonging, we were cut off from loved ones and community. Um, so a lot of these things that we, many people do have in, in a lot of different parts of the world, was really shattered. So kind of dealing with that was many levels. There was, I saw a lot of depression, a tremendous amount of anxiety. Um, how are we going to stay safe? How are we going to manage all of this? What I also saw was a shattering of stigma around mental health. Uh, I've been in this field for a long time. I've never seen that happen. There's always been a little bit, like there was a lot of stigma and then maybe a little stigma and then like just a 
flavor of stigma always, right? Like, you know, you might have a diagnosis or you might be on um, psychotropic meds and you're not gonna really tell anybody unless it's like, you know, very safe part of your circle. I just saw a shattering of that on some level collectively of like, we need help, we need to connect with mental health experts. We can do it now virtually because all of us moved on to Zoom like immediately. And I had been doing hybrid for so long that luckily it was very seamless. Like with everyone that I was working with, it was just like next day, let's just meet on Zoom, figure it out, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, that is an incredible, uh, plus that I'm seeing going on is that the genie's out of the bottle and now people, young people are reaching out and getting therapists. They want therapists. They don't, they're like, I have a therapist. I mean, it's amazing. Um, what I also really saw though is folks who had a lot of agency or access to resources, got into therapy, sought help, worked on their mental, emotional well-being as much as they could. And they might have, you know, anxiety and depression, but they stayed pretty resilient, right? The young people, we started having so many young people, high schoolers and college age coming into the center and completely uh, out of resilience, like, not making it to class, extremely depressed, severe mood swings, depression. I mean, just very scary stuff, actually. You know, we would have to bring the parents in, continue to find safety. Um, because, you know, when you're in high school and college, like friendships are everything. Yeah. And even though it has difficulties, if there's bullying or you're, you know, you're marginalized or things like that, you still kind of find your groove in the loving and belonging time of that age. And that was taken, ripped away from them. And for many, it was um, horrible. Like really, I saw that just really devastating. Of course, what I also saw is folks who lived by themselves and were extroverts. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is important. <laughs> if they were introverts and li live by themselves, if they were extroverts and live by themselves, it was really hard. They were kind of going a little crazy and had to find ways to create pods or something. For a lot of folks that had been living, and I think the world, I think the United States was at the just an overwhelming busyness. People were just so busy. I was too busy, but I wasn't really aware of that until everything was shut down. And I was like, okay, I'm anxious about this COVID and really scared about what this is going to do to all of us. And, but I am so happy to get some balance mm -hmm. like for the first time in a long time. And I hear that from a lot of folks. So what I'm really seeing and what I'm really um, kind of recommending to everyone is as we open up, and if it continues in a way that stays really safe and healthy and that we continue to try to not get pulled in to that busyness <laughs> and lose kind of sense of whatever you were able to gain during COVID that was good. For instance, <clears throat> Maybe you did turn in with more and you were doing more inner work and you were working on trauma. You were learning how to be more resilient. You were practicing more self-care, better boundaries, figuring out the ways that you calm your central nervous system. Because ultimately at the end of the day, it really is about how is your nervous system feeling? You know, is it feeling bumped out of its resilience zone? Meaning, are you anxious? Are you angry? Are you like sort of up here, are you bumped down? Are you sad, lethargic, you know? And what ways and what situations and what people and what circumstances create that, right? Mm -hmm. And getting really clear about that, having the self-awareness, working on figuring out what is good for your system and what's not good for your system. And then really making an effort to employ that. Yeah. you know, and really, and it comes down to, you know, 
really caring about oneself, really saying, okay, mm-hmm. I have to put myself, my friends, my job, my life, my family, everything is really important. But if I'm not doing well, none of that's doing well. At the end 100%. Of it. So. 100%. And you mentioned um, an issue that, that may be arising as we go back to the new normal, which is needing to figure out the balance of um, the quiet from the pandemic versus you know, not wanting to just be aware so you're not going back out in the world and just busying yourself all over again. Uh, what other things do you see as issues that may be arising as we do go back to the new normal? Well, you know, we've been ongoingly living in this state of uncertainty, right? And that's not over. Like, even yeah. though, you know, many folks are getting vaccinated, there's a level of safety brought back into our needs system. Um, you know, things are opening up and we're getting to do things. There's still a lot of those variants out there. We don't know how they are going to go. We don't know how the, you know, we don't really know how a lot of things are going to turn. So what that really calls us to end up doing is how do we learn how to deal with uncertainty? Because the reality is being a human being is always has an element of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the idea is how do you learn to live with that? How do you learn to manage that? And how do you learn to take care of yourself in the world in that way? Because that's not gonna end, even when the pandemic is over and things go back to whatever that will look like, um, you know, life is always throwing us curveballs. Yeah. For everybody, actually. I mean, even, I mean, everybody on some level or another, you know, and it's really, that's why it's so exciting that the stigma around mental health and getting help in whatever way, therapy, healers, you know, is changing because people are going to start really, they have the opportunity if they hear it to really look at these kind of circumstances that life brings us and figure out ways to deal with them that work for you, that really help you feel better, calmer, happier, you know, not shrunk in by anxiety or depression. And if you do end up having those, remove the shame. Now, the stigma of mental health is lifting, but that doesn't mean we don't have internal judgment around anything that may be going on for us. So Mm -hmm. really, you know, what I found is the most, one of the most potent tools we can use is Mm self-compassion and bringing a kind voice to ourselves because so many of us have a very intense judger in there, really poking at little things. And the thing about the judger that's really important to understand is it can be very subtle. So it's, it's about getting quiet inside at times, whether it's when you're not walking your dog or, you know, looking at nature or some kind, or you just quiet mindfulness exercises, which I highly recommend, or meditation of some kind, where mm-hmm. you're just kind of bringing your attention more into what's going on inside instead mm-hmm. of what's going on outside, because we are, our brains are designed to really find out what's going on outside but we actually need to go inside and then find out what is going on with your system. And then you can get the appropriate help around that. Thank you. Um, As always, you are just so brilliant. Um, What other things do you suggest for people to do to get back to emotional wellness and mental wellness? So of course, you know, I've always looked at everything from the holistic perspective. So, you know, treat your body well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like what Rashad was talking about, you know, some kind of fitness work. And I love the chair exercise. I love that there's so many. So we can't really say, well, I can't, you know, I don't like gyms. Okay, well, guess what? There's all this stuff, right? Mindful eating, you know, really returning to healthy eating, really, you know, food is medicine, truly, you know, the the holistic approach is that all of the things in nature are are medicine. So really taking care of our our system, our our human ecosystem is so and so important. And then knowing what your system, know what bumps it out, know what may cause a downslope or what 
might cause it to feel too anxious. And what relationships are healthy or not healthy? Like here's a chance to kind of evaluate that and really look at like, are you drawn to chaos? Are you getting yourself too involved in situations that aren't healthy for you? How can you learn how to do boundaries? How can you learn how to prioritize things that you need to prioritize? Not get pulled into too much busyness. Um, really try to spend some time in nature. Uh, figure out how you can really have a few people in your life that you can be your true self to. Really talk about your vulnerable parts, mm -hmm. those parts that may bring up shame, but that need to be expressed. Because the more we stuff those, then we have other symptoms, you know, then we want to overeat or spend too much on our devices or, you know, any sort of it, drink too much wine, you know, stuffing how we feel does lead to addictions and overuse of things that numb us out, right? 100%. And then that causes other problems. So a kind of a self-awareness piece is really important. And, um, and then bringing that compassion and that honesty, like the way to really get emotionally healthy and, and, and in a well-being state is to be honest with yourself. Really, what's mm -hmm. going on with me? What are my traumas, my triggers? What do I need to work on? What do I need to heal? Who can I safely talk about this? And definitely get help when you need it. You know, get a therapist if you can. There's so many ways to access it through insurance today or centers, you know, there's so many ways. Find someone that's a good fit for you as well. Don't just, if someone doesn't feel right, that's okay. You can find somebody else. The fit, the relationship, the therapy relationship, not only the therapist being skilled, but the relationship you have with them, the comfort level, the way that you can really be yourself in front of them, and they're able to bring that out of you is a huge part of it as well. 100%, thank you so much. Would you say there's anything that we haven't been discussing that you feel should we should address today uh, with respect to emotional and mental wellness? Well, I know that the spiritual piece is going to be done by Reverend Karen, but I definitely cannot emphasize enough of mindfulness or meditation and just awareness of either your own spirituality or your higher self. You know, some the wise mind, the intuitive side, like. Because honestly, the truth is in there. And if you make the space to hear it, it's amazing what can happen. Absolutely, especially if we don't make ourselves super busy so that we can <laughs> hear our inner voice <laughs> and continue to hear and um, come from that place of immense power. Thank you so much, Dr. Costain. Um, Reverend Frost. Please share and please unmute and share your experience. And if you can, the collective experience with, with respect to the effect of the pandemic from your spiritual perspective, as well as your experience as a black woman during the pandemic, uh, especially since we went through the social justice movement revitalization as well as COVID-19. Hi, thank you, Steffi. I, I, I definitely want to give props to the city of West Hollywood, one for having this and and the people that you chose. I, I also attended Foxy and Fear Studio. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a class pass, so I would always make a point to go there. I would go to the, the late 8 p.m. classes. Um, and, and I feel like every person that you have on this panel um, does a wonderful job of collaborating that ex understands the value of the relationship between the mind, body, and spirit, that understands that that as people who are teaching well-being and showing up as leaders in well-being, all of us recognize that and apply this to our lives in some way. And, and um, obviously the city of West Hollywood has some great politicians on um, involved so that you're choosing such great panelists. So I'm just so grateful to be here and be a part of this and, and to know you, Seppi, and, and I'm grateful that you've put this together. And, and I feel like, uh, you know, is where this, this question was really about the spiritual well-being and I feel like Rashad really hit the nail on the head of this being the best of the times or and the worst of times that 
we all got an opportunity to either be crushed by the experience or to rise up and do that. What, what Dr. Costine talked about, that healing work that many of us, um, especially those of us with means, had an opportunity to really take this year to attend to our body, mind, and spirit in a way that we may not have done so before because we were prioritizing other things and other people and the business busyness of our lives. And there, there hadn't really been an opportunity within our culture to have an opportunity to just sit and be present with what is and have the, the world as we know it fall away and, and individually, you know, make these decisions either to, um, to stay home or to go out in the world and figure out a, a way to, to support what's happening to serve as an essential worker out in the world in some way. And people made their choices. There were essential workers that stepped away from that field and felt like they were more comfortable being at home with their families and, and making that choice. And other people who are, are the heroes that were being clapped for in the streets. And so, you know, it each person really identified what was theirs to do. And some people were crushed by the experience and other people leaned into it. And so uh, to your question of, you know, it started with the pandemic and, and I think collectively, both globally and uh, culturally as an American public, we, we chose one or the other. You know, some of us had, I, I'll admit that I had uh, about five minutes and I, I love that it was five minutes. I realized that I did not have a home office and I was like, wait a minute, my, my job just moved to home with no notice and I don't have anything. Desks were all sold out. I didn't know what to do. And mm -hmm. as I was having my a meltdown, my wife was like, well, what do you need? And I started naming things and she just started handing them to me. So I didn't have to think about what am I gonna do? How, how am I go going to adjust? Everything transitioned very easily and seamlessly. But the conversation about race really shifted some things in my life that mm -hmm. um, be, personally being mixed race and also uh, ble being a black spiritual leader. I am I am a, a minister in the Centers for Spiritual Living, which is predominantly led by white men. And so when, when white men are the people who have identified with the education consists of, what that meant for me when I went through my ministerial training, I wasn't really trained to, how do we deal with a difficult cultural conversation about race? It wasn't, it wasn't in there. And we talked about sexuality. We talked about um, you know divorce, grief, all of the things that people deal with. But the conversation about race was essentially wasn't brought up in my education because white men are who designed the curriculum and they really weren't thinking about that at the time that it was structured. And I, I didn't recognize just how ill-equipped I was uh, as, as a spiritual leader and also just as a black person. The fact that I, I, I didn't take any African-American history classes in college and was working for Viola Davis. Like when people think of, you know, a black a uh, leader, civil rights leader, a uh, contemporary civil rights leader, they think of Viola. And I was realizing just how ill-equipped I was to be in the position that I was as a TV mm -hmm. executive. And so, uh, you know, to be honest, I had a, a kind of personal, um, I, I would say like a, a, I don't want to say crisis of faith, but let's, let's say an awakening. And I think a lot of people had an awakening. Either people were awakened to uh, the pervasiveness of white supremacy in a way that they hadn't noticed before. Uh, mm -hmm. And the spiritual communities that I'm a part of had a really difficult time identifying how do we create a safe space for one people of color and two people who are not people of color who are awakening to these ideas as well and need this education and none of this structure is in place right now and so i personally feverishly took every class that classes started popping up and i took every one that i i could take and uh, as dr costine mentioned doing doing all of this this work all of this healing work really required me to take a step back from my full-time job and really dedicate this year to heal. And I'm grateful that I, I was in a position where I was able to take that time and do that for myself and, and still keep a roof over my head, make sure that my basic needs were being met um, on that bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so, you know, what I think this did for, for all of us spiritually is ident help really knock us out of our comfort zone. And each one of us had an opportunity to lean in further to developing our mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being, or we we let it sort of knock us down and engage in some of those uh, damaging behaviors. And I, I also love that Dr. Kipkostian mentioned that, that inner self-talk, because that, that's a big part of it, is, is who do we give our power to? I, I call mine um, 
forgive me if I'm not allowed to say this, but shit talking Karen is what I call my my inner critic. And Reverend Karen is what I call, you know, the, my, my, my minister, my inner self. And so it's about who do I give my attention to? Does my inner critic, is she the one who's driving the, the, the car? Or, you know, if I'm Am I giving her the passenger seat where I hear she has to say, but I'm not giving her any of my attention and any of my power. Mm -hmm. And I spent that year, this year doing that work. And, and I believe that, you know, this, whether it's this time or another time that to Dr. Costine's point now is, is there, there is less of a stigma of attending to our mental health than ever before and resources and support and people who are just understanding this in a way there never has been. And, and to me, the big spiritual shift around that is compassion. You know, the whole thing mm -hmm. around wearing masks or not wearing masks is how much compassion can we give each other when we disagree? And we, we dealt with this on a political level. We dealt with it on a public safety and health level mm -hmm. and dealing with it on a, on a spiritual level as well. And I think, you know, we, we chose to either lean in and listen to that inner guidance, that inner wisdom that all of us have, regardless of our faith traditions, or we gave power to that inner critic. And wherever we are in that relationship, at any given point, we can make an active effort to start giving our power to that inner wisdom, that inner guidance, and do the best that we can to pay attention to that inner critic and, and let it be in the passenger seat. Hear what it has to say, but not give it give it any power. Thank you so much. And, and you know, what would you say to those people that are just spiritually um, searching for why? What, what is your understanding of this pandemic and everything we experienced this past year and a half and continuing sort of experience uh, with respect to spirituality? I believe that each one of us is on our own hero's journey, that Joseph Campbell, you know, identified this formula that every major mythical character and real life character uh, has, has this journey. We have a call to adventure and a series of, uh, we have allies and mentors that support us on our journey and a series of challenges that are designed for us to have this one climactic moment of faith where we have to trust something unseen, something invisible that allows us to accomplish the life of our dreams. I think we all have that. And many of us choose to look at the challenges in our lives as something that really let us fall. You know, our, our, our issues can pull the rug from underneath us and we can lay there and we can choose to allow our inner critic to have power and we can choose to uh, make decisions that are not the best decisions for our physical and emotional and spiritual well-being. And what, what I believe is that regardless of whatever faith tradition that we were born into, regardless of what culture we were born into, that there is an inner voice, an inner guidance, an inner light that is encouraging us to get up, encouraging us to believe in this invisible force. And I believe that this force can be, I, I like to say that, that or there's a fellow minister that talks about spirit goes by many names and answers to all of them, that regardless mm -hmm. of whether you were even or have attended any kind of spiritual service at all whatsoever in your life. Each one of us has an intuition that tells us to do, do something. And sometimes the thing our intuition is telling us to do sounds like it's crazy, but that thing, that voice is not going to go away. When our intuition says, this is your calling, this is yours to do. And if that thing is scary, like you mentioned in my uh, bio, Seppi, that I'm pursuing a, a, a a uh, career as a TV writer. That's been something that I've been avoiding and going back to over the course of my life, that there hasn't mm -hmm. been a, a five year period where I've stood in my truth and said, I'm gonna be a TV writer. This just happens to be where I am now, which is why I made sure it's in my bio to help keep me accountable to hold Love on it. to me. this is my calling. But that's what it is, is we all have the thing. And sometimes it's terrifying, especially if you're living in a place like West Hollywood, chances are what it, your, your calling was something that was artistically driven that wherever you probably came from originally, somebody told you that that thing w was a stretch. And anyone who lives in Los Angeles knows how difficult it is to make a living, pay your rents, uh, you know, keep a roof over your head, 
enjoy those fancy brunches, you know, like we, we really have to, to believe in ourselves and operate from an element of faith and creativity to trust that whatever it is that drove us out here to begin with is, is something that was spirit's highest calling for us. So it's about really listening to and trusting that inner voice and knowing that, you know, the kind of people who were already on that journey and trusting their inner voice, I feel like, you know, this, this experience just kind of catapulted them into the next level. And yeah. the kind of people who, um, you know, kind of knocked them down a little bit, that was something, that challenge is something that they needed for their life as well. And I'm confident that either, you know, we can make a choice of learning the lesson or we can sit in, in the effect, sit in the, the challenge and the consequence. And, you know, regardless, wherever we are in that experience, we can always get up and, and trust that inner guidance to guide us through to our heart's calling. What practices can you suggest for people to uh, first develop to learn how to listen to their inner voice and hear it? Because when you say that, I, there's so many people that are like, well, I've never heard my inner voice. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So what, what tips do you have for that? And also thank you for, for differentiating between your kind of higher wisdom self and that critic. And that, that is a practice. That's a tool you, you gave us. Um, and what other practices do you suggest to connect spiritually um, or to reconnect? And why would these practices benefit us in terms of well-being. Dr. Kostein knows what she's talking about, uh, that the med meditation and what, what I, the way I like to define meditation, because a lot of people have ideas about doing meditation, quote unquote, right. And I, I want to stress that there is no such thing as doing meditation wrong. And so what, what that what that practice looks like for me, the way that I learned to identify, uh, well, I should say the way that I learned to hear uh, my inner guidance was by sitting and paying attention, listening mm -hmm. to what I'm thinking and, and reading a lot as well. There was a book by Tara, um, I will look this up. It's called, oh, Tara Moore, M-O-H-R. It's called Plain Big. And it's it's more specifically written with women in mind, but it talks a lot about this experience of the inner guidance and the inner critic. And that that book is what introduced me to the concept of it to begin with. So it's really just once you've been introduced to the idea of knowing you do have an inner critic and inner guidance, and it's it's simply about paying attention when you catch yourself really saying something negative, your, your inner guidance does not have anything negative to say about you. So that's something that's your first clue of who is talking. If it is shit talking, it is not your inner guidance. That is not how it rolls. But uh, you know, your inner guidance loves you and it supports you mm -hmm. and it tells you to believe in yourself. It's saying all of the good things and the right things. And so that I, I, that is the big distinction. But to be able to hear it clearly is either you have to call for it. You know, if you find yourself in a space of worry, doubt, because worry, doubt, and uncertainty, and Dr. Costein also mentioned this as well, that we are always going to be in a state of uncertainty. It does not matter what is happening in the world. There's no, you might think you know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, but you have no idea if a car is going to drive through your house. Anything mm -hmm. can happen at any given moment. And so if, if you are somebody who sits in worry, sits in fear, chooses to let your doubt hold you in place. That's not serving you at all. Fear, doubt, worry does not serve you at all. And so yeah. anytime those feelings come up, choosing to ask your inner guidance, what do I need to know to release this fear? And what meditation mm -hmm. does, and what I'd like to do is uh, designate at least a half an hour every single day. And the, what that is, is it's a half an hour with yourself. So there's no mandated of, like I said, you can't ever do meditation wrong. So if what you decide to do one day is to just sit and listen to your own thoughts, if what you decide to do another day is to work on breathing practices, if what you decide to do another day is listen to songs that make you feel good, your half hour meditation practice gets to be whatever you want it to be. It does not matter what that book said it does not matter what your minister says that your relationship to yourself is your relationship you don't have to answer to to anyone else you don't have to design it based on what someone else says it should be that your inner guidance let give your inner guidance permission to drive your 30-minute practice 
And, and that will serve you no matter what. Not only will it help you hear that inner guidance more clearly, clearly but as Dr. Costine said, that you will get to know yourself more. She also mentioned mindfulness, mindful eating. So it's, it's consciously, mm. what mindful eating is, is paying attention to what you are putting into your body, not just having a bowl of something and shoving it into your mouth. But like today, I, I gave myself hot Cheetos on the way here. I did not plan for lunch and it's it's a treat. I love hot Cheetos. So I was like, I have I had a lot to do today. I'm gonna give myself this gift of enjoying this this package of hot Cheetos while I'm sitting on the 405 coming back home, hoping that I get here in time. And I'm glad that I did. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just about whether you are choosing to enjoy the taste of this fruit, this vegetable. Those are the things that mm -hmm. um, Rashad, I'm sure, would would highly recommend. I recommend them as well. But you know, mindful eating can be done with junk food. It, it's your choice, your decision, your inner guidance gets to say hot Cheetos is what it is today. And, and, you know, since, since there was no, no mess talking behind it, it was, it was presented to me as a gift. I, I allowed it and, and went with it. So it's, it's just about listening and having that practice of listening. Amazing. Uh, thank you. Uh, during the pandemic, most people were forced to transition to virtual services, which has greatly impacted uh, the way people can practice their spirituality, meet in community, and may have created different barriers for people. How did this transition impact people and how did they deal with these challenges? Yeah, as um, Dr. Kostin mentioned, that, that experience of being an extrovert and what spiritual centers do is, it, it, the ones that I go to, there's lots of hugs. And as an extrovert, I love, just getting hugs from everybody every morning. And I had this moment, this kind of breakdown of, I haven't had a good hug in such a long time, like a good spiritual hug in, in such mm -hmm. a long time. And, and, you know, so it's the combination of uh, people being robbed of physical touch, if that's where you got your physical touch from, or that experience that soul to soul mm -hmm. connection. I, and it's also, you know, the energy of what comes with being in spiritual community. There's only so much you can feel through a Zoom screen. And so uh, I, I, I think a lot of people have, you know, felt you, the, the impact of that and, and living in a virtual environment, there, there wasn't really anything to replace that. So for people who made a conscious effort, like I did to really, I, I dove into my meditation practice and my prayer practice in a way that I'd never had before. I have, I set five alarms on my phone to pray at least five times a day and just go deep, give myself as much time and permission as I wanted to pray, as long as I wanted to do it. I set up new prayer partners. I started mm -hmm. meeting with people and connecting with people more on one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so with the best of times, worst of times analogy, there was that challenge. But the other piece of it was that because more spiritual centers were offering virtual services for the first time, people were able to find communities that they would have never been able to find because they're not within their own cities. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, specifically with Spirit Uncensored, we started offering virtual services and virtual is actually working a lot better for us than in-person services. So I think there's a possibility that we wouldn't go back. We, we you know, the kind of people that wants, wants curse words in, in spiritual services are are, are it's not incredibly common. And, you know, people are really mm -hmm. uncomfortable with the idea of uncensored language and teaching yeah. this, this idea of love as a religion. People really like the, the safety of a religion that they've heard of before. So, you know, the, the kind of experience that we provide is something mm -hmm. that people all over the country are interested in, but I wasn't necessarily able to build this kind of audience in LA when we were live in person, then mm -hmm. we've been virtually. So, you know, it's, it's that combination of people who never went to a spiritual service before that are coming to our, our services. And also something that I was doing is I was going to six or seven different spiritual services on one Sunday because I could, I didn't have that luxury of, of doing that sort of thing, but I watched this person's talk and that person's talk and check in and be in different time zones. That's why I was able to watch so many in one morning and really Amazing. submerge myself. So it, it really just depends on the person. Some people, I, I learned I was not the only person that did that. And yeah. some people, you know, really stepped back from their spiritual community and 
are now looking for other op opportunities to step back in. I, I highly recommend in West Hollywood, uh, Reverend Keith Cox leads the uh, Center for Spiritual Living in West Hollywood, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. Susan, do you go there and can vouch for it? Uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible experience. And it's one of those places that, that teaches this concept of love as a religion. Love it. I just Thanks. know him from uh, the fact that our dogs played together. And I meet him in the street and he's a really nice guy. <laughs> Oh, that's exactly. wonderful. Thank you so much, Reverend Frost, as always amazing. Um, so, uh, Susan, this is very timely. Uh, if you can unmute yourself. Uh, Susan is going to be discussing um, tools and tips related to uh, the well-being of us related to our dogs and their well-being too. So Susan, what have you noticed regarding dogs and their parents during the pandemic? Well, let me just start by saying uh, a fact that probably everybody knows. Dogs are creatures of habit. And that's very important because our habits have been upended during the pandemic and have gone kind of haywire. So any slight change, even if a human, it's not a big deal to a human, a slight change of environment, of uh, living space, change of, a, of a, who's living in the home, an addition of a baby, or the departure of somebody from the home can greatly affect a dog's state of mind, it can be extremely stressful. So. I mean, there are lots of things that we can do to, to help that. Um, and obviously we're stressed as well. The more stressed we are, the more dogs pick up on it. Believe it or not, all of the emotions, sadness, happiness, fear, dogs pick up on because chemical changes in our body go right through our pores. And because dogs have such an amazing sense of smell, they pick up on that. And I've, I've worked with dogs and uh, families who were expecting a baby and whose dog was a, the, the only child for a long time. And just obviously dog doesn't know that mommy's pregnant, but they, the dog can smell and see and hear all kinds of distress mm -hmm. in the mom. The mom smells different, the mom's acting different. So all of those things, can serve to, can, can contribute to a dog's stress, which has increased during the pandemic, unfortunately. If, if the human is aware of the changes that are affecting their dog, they can do something about it. Um, because uh, knowing what your dog enjoys doing, uh, can help enormously. Even though we couldn't go outside and interact with people, it was really important to take our dogs out just for a walk or just take them in the car. No big deal. Doesn't have to go play with other dogs, but just seeing the world, especially puppies, new puppies that people have, have uh, acquired during the pandemic are especially vulnerable because their uh, optimum window of opportunity for absorbing new experiences starts to close at around 12 weeks of age. So there's a window of opportunity during which they're like sponges. Anything you can expose them to in a fun way, in a safe way, they will accept. Many people whose puppies could not go out and then suddenly are going out now are having a really hard time. That's like major, major neurosis and nobody wants a dog who's neurotic. Um, so even for, for people whose dogs are, are comfortable and have been enjoying living at home with their parents 24 seven, obviously we couldn't all be attentive to our dogs 24 seven. So there are things that you can do for your dog to keep the dog busy while you're working or while you're doing the dishes or, or whatever. Um, back to that sniffer that dogs are so good at using. I have found that just tossing 
your dog's kibble either in the grass of your yard, not anybody's grass, or on the kitchen floor if you're not a if you're not anal, and letting the dog find the kibble on his or her own. That's enormously satisfying to a dog because it stimulates mentally, primarily mentally, just a little bit physically. Dogs need mental stimulation. So finding, playing find it, and there are all kinds of find it games that you can play. And I'd be happy if anybody has any questions, to, they can e a call or email me and I'd be happy to make uh, specific suggestions. But Thank you. interactive toys that dogs can play with to keep themselves busy. Um, people think that a dog is gonna sit there quietly while you're talking or while you're on the phone. And, the dog may sit there quietly for 30 seconds and then said, I, uh, I have you know, better things to do. I'm going to find something to do. And chances are it's not going to be something that my parent <laughs> likes. So think about that. Give your dog something that you know he or she likes and let him keep busy with that. It's very, very simple. Um, and you know, our dogs are, are amazing. The, um, I think what happened also with the pandemic is people became a lot closer with their animals. Yeah. And you may know that oxytocin levels increase when a human and his or her pet make eye contact and commune, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Oxytocin levels increase. The feel-good hormone. That's amazing. It's amazing. So um I, I do hope people are if if they are having trouble getting their dogs acclimated to the new quote quote normal i would suggest there are exercises you can do to help your dog gradually um move into the, the new the new society that we are in and again, I'd be happy to talk to people or email people who would like to know more about that. Um, Thank you. I, I so. love the, uh, my dog, Chloe, loves uh, food. That's her favorite thing. Um, and she also loves to play. When I get the cat wand, I have two cats. She's the one that, that takes all the attention of the cat wand. Um, I'm going to actually do that. I'm going to, I don't give her kibble, so I'll throw her treats that was brilliant. Thank you so much for that tip. Um, you said something about uh, people who got the pets for the first time and this, this they weren't able to, for those first 12 weeks, to socialize and have that really important stimulation. And um, what, even with Chloe, I will tell you that she was super, um, she, when we used to go out before the pandemic, she was so excited with every dog that came, unless they were big. And then, you know, she likes to yell at all of them. Um, but I noticed now she's become really snooty. So she'll ignore most dogs. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what happened to you? You just, you know, you de she's developed this snootiness. So um, for, for those uh, <laughs> pet parents, and, uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of the things, by the way, that you're saying also apply to cats as a cat. Uh, mom. Um, for the people that got pets during the pandemic um, and haven't known what it was like before, for both pets and the owners, can you speak a little bit more to that? Well, again, uh, socialization, and again, it doesn't have to be dog on dog interaction. In fact, socialization is a wide variety of things. It's learning to accept the world, its sights, its sounds, its smells. So bringing a puppy out, even if you have to hold the puppy in your arms because the puppy hasn't had all his shots and you're afraid he's gonna get sick if he sniffs the pee or poo of a, a dog that may have left a, a, a deposit of something sickly, you can carry the dog around. Let him see, explore what's going on. I mean, there are people, I don't do it myself because like, it cracks me up, but there are people who walk their dogs in little strollers and it's safe. <laughs> it's safe. It allows the dog to look around and, and, and see the world. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not answering your question fully. What can uh, people do? You know, again, 
even if you you're you're you can teach your dog some tricks tricks are fun as long as you're having fun or teaching your trick your your dog some basic obedience cues oh, you know sit lie down come when i call you if you're having fun and your dog is having fun and you do it in short increments of time your dog will love it first of all dogs don't speak english and we need a communication system with our dogs right so that communication system is obese basic obedience cues as well, and not only the, the physical uh, gestures that we use to get a behavior, but the, the words, the sounds that we use to ask for a behavior. The more precise we can be, the more patient we can be with our dog, the, the easier it'll be for a dog to learn obedience cues. And again, because a dog doesn't know how to live in a human world unless we teach him or having this communication system you say sit oh i can do that hey mom i just sat where's my treat or mm -mm, i know i'm not going to get a treat because i i sit i sit really well and i'm going to get fat if i get a lot of treats but you say thank you to your puppy or your dog for giving you the behavior you've asked for what does it cost you nothing good boy good girl a scratch on the chest they love that it takes yeah. so little to make a dog happy <laughs> and um it takes so little to make me happy because my dog cracks me up every single day I love it. every day I love it. um there are i mean for people who are having a lot of trouble with uh dogs that are having uh I don't want to go into separation anxiety because that's a term that people have thrown around that is um, poorly used. It's a it's a condition, a very serious condition where a dog is so anxious and so fearful of being separated from its owner that it will do things like scratch, chew, anything to get out and to get to the to the owner. Right. I mean, even jumping out of windows has happened. Um, if it's that bad, I recommend a veterinary behaviorist because the veterinarian and a behaviorist together are fantastic. There are very few in the city of Los Angeles. I know of two that I absolutely adore. Their waiting list is long, their prices are high, but they're not just vets. They have studied animal behavior in veterinary school which most vets don't learn. They learn medicine, they don't learn behavior. So a veterinary behaviorist can help evaluate your dog's behavior and if it's serious enough, can propose some kinds of remedies, uh, medications uh, that might help calm a dog for a period of time just so that he, can, he or she can function, kind of like taking Prozac, right? which dogs do as well. Um, and um, there are also natural remedies if you don't wanna to go to you know, hard, hard drugs. Natural remedies, plant-based remedies are out there to calm dogs and I'd be happy to, again, give you some of that information and tell you where you can get it if you're interested in finding out. Um, Basically, we want our dogs to trust and respect us. I know we all say it, oh, my dog has to love me. I want my dog to love me. You don't have your dog's trust. You don't have your dog's respect. The love, you can just forget about the love part, mm -hmm. okay? And dogs love in very different ways from us. They have similar emotions to us in many ways, but they, um, they need to trust us implicitly and they need to respect us. So having a common language, a, a communication system is one way. Enjoy, in knowing how your dog can be entertained on his or her own for short periods of time without being needy and you know, exhibiting attention-seeking behaviors you know, like barking or jumping or pawing at you or whatever, that's also helpful. Find out what makes your dog calm and provide it. Um, Susan, so you said that uh, routine and habit is very important and any kind of difference causes a lot of um, stress on the dog. 
um, I think we all actually I could I could relate to that myself as a human because we've formed this long one year and a half of habits now. And for those of us that are going back to the office, what do you suggest on how to deal with our pets? Because we're now shifting the habit again. So what can um, pet parents do to make this change and this transition easier on their pets and quite frankly, on, on themselves. themselves too? Yeah. yeah. Well, before going back to work, ideally, if you have some time before going back to work or whatever it is you do outside of the house, is to gradually get your dog to accept the distance from you that he's going to have to experience at some point in, in small increments of time. For example, um, standing with your dog, stepping back, I mean, really simple, stepping back, counting to five in your head. And if your dog doesn't bark or whatever, good dog, approach the dog again, give him a treat. And little by little, it, so it sounds silly, but it's not. Little by little, moving away from your dog, very small increments of space and time, getting the dog used to, oh, well, mom's over there, I'm over here, nothing catastrophic is happening, I guess I'm okay. Um, teaching your dog that, um, you know, being, being outside is, oh, I'm sorry, not being outside. Um, if you have the time to prepare your dog, and again, I can, I can provide exercises for people who would like to, uh, to know the details, there are things you can do to gradually acclimate your dog to your going away. For example, you're, there are triggers when you're when you get ready to leave the house. There are triggers that your dog picks up on immediately. You pick up the keys, you pick up your bag, you put your jacket on, you tie your shoes. Dogs know you're leaving the house, right? So, what can you do instead? Rather than leaving, pick up the keys, jiggle them around, put them back, and go back uh -huh. about your business. Don't go out. So, uh, make those triggers less less forceful and less uh, painful to the dog by kind of, uh, what's the word, hello, uh, kind of desensitizing the dog to those wow. things. Very, very simple wow. stuff. That's so important. Thank you. I, I've, I'm going to start doing that a lot uh, to desensitize Miss Chloe to uh, me going back out to, uh, um, you know, I, I'm sure Mayor Pro Tem Meister is, uh, has been, I know she's been thinking about, we're going to go back to council chambers. So we need to desensitize the little critters, the cute ones on uh, oh, us not being there. <laughs> Our dogs are perfect. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Susan. We do have, uh, now we're going to transition to the Q&A portion. So if anyone has questions, uh, we have another uh, seven, uh, 16 minutes. Uh, and there was, um, there is a question I want to address um, from Maureen Sullivan, and I'm just going to open it up to whoever uh, wants to just unmute yourself to address this. Um, she's expressing that uh, she's never felt so stressed during COVID as she does now due to the relaxing of the mask guidelines, despite the fact that the Delta variant is spreading. Um, she says she doesn't want maskless and potentially unvaccinated and COVID infected people uh, being forced on her um, and still needing to go out and, and do essential grocery shopping to the bank, to CVS, to work. And it's, it's, there's a lot of anxiety relying on that honor system and self-attestation uh, and, and also dealing with friends that um, are uh, immune compromised with cancer or a friend with a child that has leukemia who are also terrified. What, what can, um, Dr. Costing, I see you unmuted yourself. Please go ahead and address this. Well, I think ultimately at this point, as things are changing, shifting, mask, you know, masks, no masks, whatever, everyone has to keep their own boundaries intact. 
if you want to continue to wear one or two masks or N95s or whatever it is to stay as safe as possible, do that. And that's going to continue for a very long time. Um, if it's very, very scary for you to still go into a grocery store and you have the resources, there are still delivery systems out there so that you do not have to go out to these places where people are now choosing not to wear masks. Um, and I think we just continue to do what we've been doing all along to keep ourselves safe, you know, um, keep those boundaries in place for yourself for as long as you need to. And um, I think that what I'm seeing, at least because I live in progressive LA, um, people are not, you know, getting uh, intrusive or, or angry or, or anything. Like people are having, you know, continuing to wear masks. I see it everywhere. And there's, it's, it is what it is. So um, people are respecting that. You know, people are honoring and respecting what other people are needing to do. And I think that that will continue. Um, and if, you know, if you need to wear a mask for the next year, absolutely. If you need to do whatever it is that you need to do to stay safe and keep your system safe or your, you know, um, at risk friends, do whatever it is that you need to do. I've, I've also noticed that there are definitely, uh, when I walk Chloe out in, in my neighborhood in Mid-City, there's still a lot of people wearing masks, um, which is great. And um, even some businesses that their employees are still choosing to wear masks. There's still some businesses that say you can't come in here unless you have a mask on, which is okay. Um, and so I, I have noticed that as well. Let's see. Are there any other questions for our expert panelists? Please type them into the Q&A portion. If I may, I just wanna make a comment um, uh, right. to Dr. Lauren and Reverend Karen. Well, actually to Rashad as well. My experience has been in dealing with the, uh, the isolation of pandemic getting out of yourself, as Rashad mentioned, getting out of yourself, focusing on something other than ugh, me is so, so important. And if you, if there's any way that you can make yourself helpful to another person, even if it's just one person, and um, it will help you make yourself feel a lot better. I, I speak from experience. I'm a member of several organizations. I volunteer, and thank goodness, I had these organizations mm -hmm. to busy myself with because there were times that I got very low. Of course, I have my dog, but you know, she doesn't play chess. She doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't shoot hoops. Anyway, um, but yeah, thinking about getting out of yourself and thinking of others, I think is a really good way of diminishing your sense of isolation and depression. That's all. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Susan. And, and you are, um, uh, I know that you're also, uh, you volunteered for We Own Neighbors Helping Neighbors. So um, that I'm glad that that uh, will help you as well. And I, and I can relate definitely. Um, any, other, any other comments from our experts? Anything that has come up that you want to talk about? Yes. Oh, I just wanted to kind of, I know, I, I felt like I wasn't answering the, the, the um, attendees full question. She had also really spoken about the anxiety. Yes. So if that is really coming up, do what you need to do to take care of the anxiety. As we do open up and there still is so much uncertainty, there's so many things that you can do for yourself to help with your anxiety. And if it's really, really bad, you know, definitely check into some medications. They're not all too strong or too bad. They're lifesavers for a lot of people. Obviously, we don't want to over-medicate. I'm not a medication pusher, but when it's really necessary, I definitely um, send, you know, folks to psychiatrists. It's can be hard to find psychiatrists, actually. We're sort of in a psychiatrist crisis. Um, but you know, take care of yourself around this. Don't suffer for too long. <laughs> you know, I know people that, and I've been in this, you know, 
camp too, I really like to be natural when I can, but sometimes that can go to an extreme like anything. Mm -hmm. and, and you're in an extreme, I wanna be natural, I just wanna take all natural, yet your system actually doesn't create certain chemicals on its own well. And you know, there's so many reasons for that that are not your fault, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this way where we can feel like, well, you know, I, I shouldn't do this or it's not good or it's bad or what have you. Um, really do, do what works and do what you need to, to feel the best that you can. I just want to add to that. I got um, a physical just recently and I am completely vitamin D deficient, uh, especially being yeah. out of the sun. And I didn't realize this is actually an issue with, 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 people in, uh, I guess, uh, California in general, um, but it must have become really deficient. And I will say I did feel so many muscle aches and lethargy um, issues. And my um, doctor prescribed a huge amount of a high dose vitamin D. And I've been taking it for three weeks. And I, I have less pain in my muscles. So if you are experiencing these pains, um, I would say definitely go get your uh, physical as well and check that out too. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Sepi. That's so important. I mean, I am very much a supplement person, obviously food first, yeah. but supplements because your system doesn't make it or we're not gonna get it because of whatever reason, it's so important. It's great that you mentioned that because that really helps with immune as well, the immune system. Yeah, and Dr. Absolutely. Lawrence, I think it was you who mentioned, um, take your time. If you need help and you need a, a therapist, uh, take your time and make sure you're comfortable with that person. Yes. Exactly. I speak from experience. Um, so, I mean, I went to a therapist who tried to feed me two of her sandwiches when I was in her office. Right? So you got to make sure that you trust the person. That was the extreme. That was one. Thing. Okay, that's and, extreme. Yeah. And it was in France, oh. which, which was many years ago when they thought that psychotherapy was voodoo. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're not comfortable, hightail it out of there. Find somebody you're comfortable with. And somebody that's not, that you can't push around because I found <laughs> I don't know. I don't like, yeah, I'm not proud to say this, but so with so many therapists, I could basically bullshit my way through stuff and I wasn't helping me. Finally, when I found a therapist that wouldn't take my crap, that's when I started learning and getting better. Anyway, my two cents. Thank you, Susan. I have, a, I, have a, I have another question that's come up right now uh, for me is, uh, and I think it's important to discuss, uh, we have some time. How do you um, find your uh, people to open up to about needing help, about being depressed, about having anxiety? Because sometimes it's not easy to even admit that to anybody. That's such a great question, Zephi. You know, the first ingredient that a person needs to have to open up to is empathy. And you know, when they do tests on what makes a therapist really great, the first ingredient is empathy. And empathy is like a bomb on our nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. And just hearing a really genuine, I'm sorry, you're going through that, that sounds really hard your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the down regulator, mm -hmm. it's gonna start doing its job. It's gonna start making you feel back into the zone, right? And so well-meaning people often wanna go into fix it mode and that is, has its place, trust me, it has its place. But empathy, compassion, active listening first. And then maybe, oh, well, this worked for me or, you know, if you have a friend or a, a, people in your circle that are not providing that and you're not finding that you're getting kind of the, if, or you've noticed them being judgmental in other ways, then be careful. Yeah. Because the last thing you need when you're, sh when you're showing your most vulnerable parts 
those little tiny kid parts inside of us mm -hmm. is someone to be remotely judgmental, not really show some genuine empathy. It can set us back, actually. Yeah. So that's, that's so true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful, beautiful yeah. answer. And uh, I see Commissioner Roche is here. Uh, our public safety commissioner, Roshan, and she said, you're so good at, at, at giving empathy. Um, so just wanted to let you know. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, thank you to all of you for your time, for your tips, for being open with us. Um, I just want to also thank, um, again, Mayor Pro Tem Meister and uh, the council members who supported this panel. And thank you to all of you who attended today. This in itself, coming to this panel is, is, is one step to well-being, and I applaud you all for that. Um, and Susan, your tips for dogs, I was just beaming with a smile on my face the whole time. They were incredible. Um, I hope that you are all going to have a safe week and enjoy the moment and enjoy being present and um, have a good night.